This is uncharted territory. The reason it's uncharted territory is because nothing like Bitcoin has ever happened before. And I don't say that uh, you know, uh, just as an extreme statement. I, I think it's absolutely true. The idea of a, trust, a trusted, decentralized network that allows any individual anywhere in the world to transmit value or establish ownership over a digital asset and transmit that in a matter of seconds anywhere in the world, transparently, safely, almost instantaneously, and for less than a third of a penny. That has never happened before. And we don't know what uses that will be put to yet. I can think of a thousand different interesting uses, but we don't really know. It fundamentally changes some of the core assumptions of how money works. And, and the thing is that while we conceive of money as this universal thing, in fact, we experience it as many different aspects of money. There is fast money, there is slow money, there is money that works best in small increments, and money that works best in large increments. Um, I have some money that is printed on metal coins in my pocket, and that is fantastic money to use to pay a parking meter. If I try and go buy a Porsche with that form of money, I will need a wheelbarrow, and most likely they will look at me funny at the Porsche dealership. Right? Or if I try to buy a house with that form of money. If I try to pay for the parking meter with a check, or a bearer certificate bond, I will be looked at funny by the parking attendant. And when I try to get on a tram here, apparently I need a Mickey card. <laughs> And I don't know what a Mickey card is, Mikey. or a Mikey card, and how to get it, and how to charge it. And I certainly don't know if I can use it for anything else. What I'm getting at is that we don't experience money as a universal protocol. We experience money as a series of fragmented networks, very, very fragmented networks. And there's a parallel to this. Before the Internet age, telecommunications was like this. If you wanted to send a long distance message, you'd write it down on paper and use the postal service. If you wanted to transmit video, you'd use a broadband connection to a satellite and bounce it off there. If you wanted to transmit text rapidly, uh, you'd use a telegram or a telex. If you wanted to transmit an image, you'd use a fax machine. Uh, if you wanted to transmit video, well, you couldn't really. You could put it on a VHS tape and then mail it somewhere. So every type of content had a different network, and those networks were segregated by speed and convenience and cost and time to destination and all of these restrictions. And the internet brought all of these things together. It brought all of these things together and allowed us to use a single network, regardless of the type of message we were sending, and use it for fast and slow, for small and large, for cheap and expensive, right? And that was really an interesting thing, because it suddenly changed the way we use information. It didn't just make it more convenient. It didn't just make it more accessible. It fundamentally changed the way we used information. Things that we would only do sparsely, we could do now continuously. Things that were too expensive to do were now cheap. Things that were too far to reach became close. We're about to do that with money. Bitcoin does that to money. In the financial environment, there are literally hundreds of different networks. There is SWIFT, the Society for Worldwide Interbank Fund Transfer. And you've never used SWIFT, unless you're a broker. You've never used SWIFT. A SWIFT terminal is something a bank has, and they use it to send $25 million wire transfers to another bank somewhere else in the world. Right? So that's the big payment only bank to bank network. There's Visa, and you can use that. If you're a merchant, you can receive on it, and it's a consumer to business network, but it only works really above five dollars approximately. It doesn't work for less than five dollars. And there's an upper limit really on what you can send. So if you want to send $25 million through Visa, you can't really do that. And you can use checks. 
and you can use uh, ACH Clearinghouse, the way we call it in, in the States, which is uh, checking account clearinghouse for transactions between individuals. Um, I don't know how, how easily you can send money from individual to individual here. Uh, if you want to, say, pay your rent. Um, in the United States, most people write a check, because that's the most convenient way to do it. They take money from a digital bank account. They write on a piece of paper. They put this paper into a terrestrial mail transport system, where it takes three days to arrive at their landlord. Their landlord takes this piece of paper presents it to the bank, which in itself is complicated. The bank then types something into a computer, and then the money is transferred. and Then it sits there for three to five business days. This is in 2014, in the most prosperous country in the world. And this is no less than insanity. Right? Now, I don't know if it's easier for you guys here. In the UK, it's somewhat easier to send money between two individuals in a bank probably a bit easier for you. But if you wanted to send money from here to New Zealand, even though it's not that far, I bet things would suddenly get a lot more complicated. And you might have to revert to some kind of paper-based instrument. Or you might have to pay some third-party intermediary like Western Union $35 for the privilege of moving money across an ocean. As if they have to physically carry stacks of gold. Whereas, in fact, what they're doing in the back end is no different than an email. We live in a world where banking is horribly fragmented, where finance as we experience it is broken. The experience for a consumer is different from that from a business. The experience for a small amount is different from a big amount. If you want to send money fast, you can only send small amounts. If you want to send large amounts and fast, you can't do that unless you pay a lot of money. and It gets really, really complicated as soon as you try to send money across borders. And then there's Bitcoin, a single network that can transmit anything from microtransactions, meaning you can send a thousandth of a penny, to gigatransactions, meaning you can send a hundred billion dollars. And the fee you will pay is the same, exactly the same, a third of a penny, maybe. And the time it will take to transmit is the same. Five seconds later, it's going to be visible across the entire global network. You'll get clearance in ten minutes. And it doesn't care about borders, and it doesn't care about who the recipient is, and it doesn't care if the recipient is a consumer or a business. It doesn't care if the sender is a consumer or a business. If the device you're using to send it is a desktop, a mobile, or not, it doesn't care if you took the keys off a paper wallet or if you typed a pin into a wallet or if you use your desktop computer. Bitcoin bridges all of those things and provides for the first time something that's never happened before, which is a unified protocol for transmitting value. Now, if you think about Bitcoin that way, it is as big a revolution in the affairs of finance as TCPIP was in communication. It provides a single unified transmission protocol that spans any amount, any destination, and gives you a flat playing field that anyone can connect to. Uh, 